All right. So as we are just, again, a few hours into the new year, I wanted to take some time this morning just to sit down together and look at just three verses of Scripture in Paul's letter to the Romans. Um, Three verses that are short and yet carry power for us today. Verses that carry blessing and challenge and instruction. And I'll be quite honest, these are, these are words poured out by the Holy Spirit that I am praying would become something of a prescription for us here at First Baptist. Something of a precept even for us as we move into the new year and, uh, and moving forward as a body. So if you have a copy of Scripture... You can open it up to Romans chapter 15, where we're going to be today. And as you're making your way there to kind of set the background of our passage today, Paul is in the midst of writing what is considered to be, uh, by many people, to be the greatest theological treatise of the gospel in Scripture. That Paul is explaining, walking his Roman readers through the incredible love and mercy of God in the face of our depravity as broken people. That God has proven his love to us. And that while we were yet sinners, enemies of God, children of wrath, Christ died for us. So that we might be justified with and reconciled to God by faith in Christ's sin atoning death and death defeating resurrection. And then beginning in chapter 12, about a dozen chapters in or so, Paul begins to shift and talk about how the truth of what God has done for us in Christ should impact how we live our lives every single day. You might remember that famous verse in Romans 12, 1, when Paul says, Therefore, in view of God's mercy, brothers and sisters, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to God, holy and pleasing to Him. This is your true and spiritual, your right and proper worship. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And yet, beginning in chapter 12 and moving on throughout the rest of the letter, Paul is, is trying to teach the Romans how to see all of life through the lens of the gospel of Jesus Christ, his grace and mercy. But in particular, he focuses again and again throughout these chapters on what that looks like together as the body of Christ as the church living life, not as individuals, but as a family. For example, he talks about how we're to practice our spiritual gifts in community with one another, even how we we relate to the authorities, even to how we eat and drink in such a way so as not to cause a brother or sister to unnecessarily struggle in various ways. You can summarize what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 12, verse 10, where he says, Outdo one another in showing honor. Let brotherly love and affection grow and continue. By the time you get to the, the 15th chapter of Romans, all of these themes of what it means to live our lives together in the gospel come together in what you could consider a pastoral benediction. Words from Paul that bring Blessing, bring challenge, and again, bring instruction for us today. So let's read together Romans 15, beginning in verse 5. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, on this last Sunday of the Christmas season, and we still 
sit under the lights of love and joy and hope and peace that Christ brings. Father, it's a reminder for us that you are the guy who meets us where we are, right here and right now. In the midst of our imperfections and our struggles, our anxiety, our sin, our fear, whatever it is that we're dealing with, Father, Jesus, you are Emmanuel, the God who is with us, who moves towards us in our brokenness. And Father, as we take time today to look at these words from Paul, breathe that by your Spirit, words that I am praying would become something of a prescription for us here at First Baptist. That the very same Spirit that inspired these words from Paul would energize us, help us to see these things clearly, how they apply to our lives Individually, yes, Lord, but, but together as a family, as a loving family of Jesus' followers. Holy Spirit, give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear. And give us hearts that seek you first. In Jesus' name, amen. In these three verses, breathed out by the Holy Spirit, Paul gives us the tools, the task, the goal, and even the means towards spirit-empowered, gospel-centered community in the local church. The tools, the task, the goal, and the means. The first thing he gives us is the tools. Again, having having laid out in these last few chapters this calling to live our lives together for the gospel, not just as individuals, but as a, as a community of faith, as a body of Christ, and to, to live under the grace and the mercy that God has shown us, the very next thing Paul says here in verse 5 is, May the God of endurance and encouragement, or other Good, solid translations say, the God who gives endurance and encouragement. The tools that someone gives you says a lot about the nature of the task that you're about to engage in. The tools that someone hands you says a lot about the nature of the task that you're about to engage in. For example, if someone hands you a T-post driver and some th thick leather gloves and some heavy pliers, you're probably not going ice skating. You're probably going to be building fence, right? Or if you're about to go on a hike and the outfitter hands you a backpack with a tent and a bedroll and three days' supply of food, you're probably not going to be back in an hour. At least not by design. You're probably going overnight. And when someone tells you you're going to need endurance and you're going to need encouragement for the journey ahead, that should be a pretty clear indication that what you're about to engage in is not going to be quick and it's not going to be easy. It's going to require perseverance and endurance and encouragement, which means there's going to be moments where you want to quit and where you want to give up. And it's going to be hard and you're going to get worn down and weary and exhausted. So you're going to need Endurance and encouragement for the road ahead. And again, Paul has just described for these believers over these chapters this calling to live life together as the body of Christ for the glory of God through the gospel. And he says, you're going to need endurance and encouragement for this journey. Now, the good news is it's not endurance or encouragement that you and I have to muster up within ourselves. In fact, the, the best news is that Paul is praying that God would give his very own endurance and encouragement to the church. This is God's endurance and encouragement given to us. God is not sending us out 
empty-handed to figure this out on our own and make our own way. But no, Paul is saying that the God of endurance and encouragement would give us what we need. We give the Romans and 2,000 years later, you and I, what we need for this calling to live life together for the gospel. Now, what does that encouragement and endurance look like for us as, as believers? How does that practically happen? Well, we, we know from what Scripture teaches us, but especially what Paul is writing here in Romans, and especially if you go back to Romans 8, that the source and the fountain for that endurance and that encouragement for us as believers is the very Holy Spirit of God who dwells within us. Jesus promised his disciples that his going away would actually be for their benefit because the very Spirit of God would come and dwell within them, would guide them, would encourage them, would teach them, would remind them, would give them the power that they need to be the church. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Paul said, You will receive, or Jesus said, You will receive power, dynamis, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. In Romans chapter 8, verse 26, Paul says that the Spirit is there to help us in our weakness. And so we need endurance and we need encouragement that comes from the very Holy Spirit of God that dwells within us individually and dwells within us as the church, as the body. More specifically, and in context to our passage today, we get a lot of that endurance and encouragement from Scripture itself. Just look at verse 4, just previous to the chapter, the verses we looked at today. In Romans 15, verse 4, it says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. So by the Holy Spirit that dwells within us, by the word of God breathed out by that spirit, we're to receive encouragement and endurance for the road ahead. There's a third and really important and for me really exciting way that we also receive endurance and encouragement. We have to see the full picture before we get there. But for now, we need to see very clearly, these are the tools that Paul is praying God would give us for the journey ahead. And those tools tell us a lot about this journey of what it means to be the church. It's going to require endurance, and it's going to require encouragement. So what is that task? That calling for which Paul is praying that the church would receive endurance and encouragement. This is what Paul says. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. That he would grant us to live in such harmony with one another, in accord or in the pattern or in the way of Christ Jesus. That word harmony could also be translated literally as have the same mind among one another, in accordance with Christ. Now, what does that mean? Because Paul is writing to the church in Rome. Rome is a melting pot of cultures and backgrounds. You had Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, male and female, rich and poor, young and old, all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of ethnicities, all, all coming together. And so what does it mean for, for that church and for even us today to be living in harmony with one another, being of the same mind. You can think of it as unity of mind and harmony of life. What does that look like in the church? Well, we can tell from the context and from what Paul has already said, it doesn't mean that we're all going to agree with each other. In fact, Paul spends most of Romans 14 trying to instruct these believers in Roma how to give grace to each other in the different ways that we see and even live out our faith. That there's to be unity in the essentials of the gospel, but freedom in the non-essentials and grace in all things. So Paul isn't expecting that harmony of life and unity of mind looks like us agreeing on every little thing. It doesn't, especially does not mean uniformity, that we're all going to look alike and talk alike and, and see the world around us the same way. But it does mean that that unity of mind and harmony of life 
would look like our heart's affections being so set on Jesus and so set on his kingdom that it would counteract the very natural instincts in me and in you towards pride, ego, judgmentalism, and selfishness. That we'd be so focused on Christ and his kingdom that it would counteract that natural pull that you and I have to demand our own way above all things. This is the way Paul puts it in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, all things that we receive from Jesus, complete my joy by being of the same mind having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of the others. And then Paul summarizes this, this unity of mind and harmony of life by saying this, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus which is almost exactly what Paul just prayed in Romans 15, verse 5, that we would live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, or in the pattern, or in the way, or the example of Christ. In other words, would he treat each other as Jesus has treated us? Would we extend each other the same grace and mercy and compassion that Christ has extended to us. This is what Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 13. A new command I give you. Love one another. But he wasn't vague or undefined on what that love looks like. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And Paul would go on to write to the Corinthians and the Colossians that that kind of love is is patient and kind. It's not irritable or resentful. It keeps no record of wrongs. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It, it does not delight in evil. It rejoices in the truth. And that's an important thing for us to say, even here and now, because there's a lot of skewed understandings of what love looks like, especially in the culture today. That, that to love someone means to accept them and embrace them and celebrate everything they do. And that's not what love is. In fact, Paul says love does not delight in evil. It rejoices in the truth. And because of that, Paul tells the Colossians that we as God's chosen people, holy and beloved, are to put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, gentleness, bearing with one another and forgiving one another as the Lord has forgiven us. Now before you maybe fall into the same camp that I do of immediately starting to beat up yourself for all the ways you fail to do that in almost every way in all of your relationships, we have to first rest in the fact, that the, the good news, that Jesus really does love you in that way. All the ways that we just described. He really does, not just in this vague, general sense, but you personally. That he knows you, all of you, fully and completely, all the ways you fail, all the ways you're going to fail, your worst moments as a human being that you pray no one else ever knows about. Jesus knows that fully and completely, and his heart is filled with compassion for you. Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, because in Christ you belong to him. He truly does love you in that way. We have to always return to that again and again. We should never get tired of hearing that because we need to hear it and be reminded of it every single day. But by now, at this point, we should understand very clearly, since this is the calling that we have, to, to love one another as Christ has loved us, to extend compassion and kindness and grace and mercy and forgiveness that we've received from Him, to live together as a body, as a church, with unity of mind and harmony of life, now we understand why we need endurance and encouragement, right? 
Now we understand why we need this long game perspective, that we're going to be perseverant because there's going to be moments when we struggle and fail and fall and going to want to give up because this kind of community is costly and it's hard, which is why most people don't even try it. We just settle for shallow, for superficial, for a fake smile and a handshake, and then go on with the rest of your week. This, this is the kind of community that, that costs so much that we try to stay at arm's length and can treat church like a movie theater where I can come in and sit down and not speak to another soul and get up and leave and, and never interact with another person. That's not the, the harmony of life and the unity of mind that Paul is describing. It's it's shallow and superficial. And here's the problem. Shallow and superficial doesn't even come close to the goal and the purpose that Paul is praying for in this passage. Because Paul makes it clear that this community that we're called to doesn't exist in and of or for ourselves. We're a community with a mission and a purpose and a goal. And this is what that purpose and goal is, Paul says. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the goal. We would glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That we reflect back to God and out into the world in our words, in our actions, in our life together, the goodness and the beauty, the holiness and the love of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Spirit. That's what it's about. That's what the church is about, the glory of God. That's what the Bible is about. That's what creation is about. That's what everything is about, is the glory of God the Father Almighty. Amen. And there's not even time for us to begin to look at the hundreds and hundreds of verses throughout Scripture that point to this truth, that everything at the end of the day is about the glory of God. But just look at one really quick in Ephesians chapter 1. This is a really good passage for us to look at because it's a passage that's about salvation and our salvation in Christ, so it can sound like it's about us, but look at what the real goal is. In love, God predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to what? To the praise of his glorious grace. Then in verse 12, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. And then down in verse 14, when Paul's talking about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Notice how a verse that's about us has nothing to do with us. It has everything at the end of the day to do with the praise and glory of God. I mean, that truth is revelatory in and of itself this morning and can honestly save us from a lot of frustration and disappointment. Because if we are walking through life under the illusion that the story is about us, that really at the end of the day, we are the center of the universe. We are going to have a life filled with discontentment and frustration and despair. And I know none of us in this room would ever dare say, I am the center of the universe. I'm what the world revolves around. But I have moments where I feel slighted and, and cheated because at the end of the day, there's emotions in me that, that want the world to revolve around that want to be the center of the universe. And I'm going to go ahead and say that you probably do too. How often the emotions that we have when we feel treated and slighted basically come down to the fact that we want everything to revolve around me. But yet if we can understand the glorious truth that it's not about us, it's not about me, it's about the glory of God, then guess what? We've just jumped on board with what the whole purpose of the universe is. The glory of God over and above all things. 
And here's what's important for our passage this morning, if we go back to Romans 15, is the fact that Paul is praying that God would give us the endurance and encouragement that we need, that we would live lives of unity and harmony with one another as the church, and that all of that pours back into the glory of God the Father, that the way that we live life together as the church in unity of mind, and harmony of life, loving and caring and serving one another as Christ has served us is one of the primary ways, not secondary, one of the primary ways that God's glory is put on display in the world. In fact, Paul even says in Ephesians chapter 2, God has seen fit for his manifold wisdom to be put on display now through the church. Through us. Mark Dever puts it this way. It is in the church that God's Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, rules and reigns and is put on display in the earth. It is made visible in the lives of love that we live. God intends to display His glory through the local church today. As Christians live together in patience and forgiveness, justice, mercy, and love. This has been the story of the church in our best moments throughout the last 2,000 years. It's not only the, the, the truth that we proclaim with our words, but in our lives of what God has done. Listen, it wasn't the fact that, that the early Christians were going around proclaiming that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, that that alone was what all of a sudden turned the Roman Empire upside down. It was the fact that the pagans looked at the way Christians were loving and serving one another, and they even wrote to their own officials saying, look at how they love one another. Look at how they serve one another. Look how they care for one another. And it's in those lives of love and service towards one another that they saw the truth that Christ really did rise from the grave. Five centuries later, when Patrick went to Ireland, it wasn't just some unique, cute way of him explaining the Trinity that all of a sudden made the Celtics turn upside down. It was the fact that Patrick established these monasteries that lived life together as Christians that was so compelling and so different from the culture around them, and yet had such open honors of hospitality to receive and to share that love with others that they became synonymous with refuge and healing and hope. Or again, just to put it back to what Jesus said to the disciples in John 13, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, people will know that you are my disciples. By the way, you love one another. And just so we don't miss this, this important detail, yes, Christians, we are called to love all people. But when Jesus says, by the way, you love one another, he's talking about the family of the church. He's not talking about just this general love. He's talking about the love that we share together as brothers and sisters in Christ, sons and daughters of God, washed in the blood of the Lamb. This unique family that we're a part of. By the way, you love one another. Love that gives glory to God and love that the watching world wants to get in on. And it's put on display. And so when you see all of that, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another and accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If for anything like me that is beautiful and compelling and absolutely overwhelming at the same time. Like, make no mistake, there's no program for what Paul is, is praying for here. There's no five easy steps, there's no 12 month strategy to arrive at this. That's why Paul is praying that God would do this, because only God by his spirit can accomplish this in a bunch of sinful and broken people. And yet this is, this is what I'm praying for, for us. Not simply as, as your pastor, but just as a person, that this would be true of us. That God would grant us the encouragement and the endurance. We may live lives together of such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together we would with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And yet even though that's true, that that's what we're, I'm praying for, and it's something that only God's Spirit can do in us, is there at least, I don't know, a first step? Something that we, by God's grace, can begin to do? To lean towards that calling? And by God's grace, I think there is. In fact, Paul doesn't leave us empty-handed with this benediction. Notice again what he says. Therefore, he says, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the tools and the calling and the goal, but then he gives us the means. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. There it is again. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And so the first thing we have to notice, again, because we can never hear this enough, is that the welcome that we're called to extend to one another find its definition and its root in the welcome that Christ has already extended to us. Fully and completely. In the midst of our mess and our sin and our brokenness and all that's going on in our hearts and lives, as we heard on Christmas Eve, Christ has moved towards us in our brokenness. And all the mess that we are and said, I'm glad you're here. It's good to see you. I would love to sit down and share a meal with you. Now that sounds a little too, I don't know, soft and mushy. That's almost exactly what Jesus says in Revelation to the church in Laodicea. It's a complete mess. I mean, they're, they're, they're failing on all kinds of different things. And Jesus comes and says, you are pitiful, you're broken, you think you're rich, but you're poor, you're blind, you're naked, you got, you're lukewarm, you got all these issues, I want to spit you out of my mouth. Therefore, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If you open the door, I'll come in and I'll give you a tongue lashing like you wouldn't believe. No, I'll come in and I'll sit at the table with you. Eat with you and you with me. Jesus moves towards us in the mess that we are and he welcomes us because he knows that he is what we need. More than anything else, he is what we need. And so that's the way that Jesus has welcomed us. What does it mean for us to welcome one another as Jesus has welcomed us. I mean, it's different for everybody in some ways. But think about this. Because, because Jesus knows us and loves us and welcomes us in this way, that means that we don't have to hide with Jesus. It means we don't have to pretend to be something or someone that we're not with Jesus. We can exhale. We can relax. We can let our guard down. And yet unfortunately, that's not how many people feel when they come to church. I was listening to a podcast a few weeks ago from two pastors that I really respect, and they asked this very um, challenging question that I just want to put forward for you guys to think about, even though I'm kind of scared what the answer is, is going to be. And the question is this. When you come to church on Sunday morning, when you gather with believers in worship or in Sunday school or in Bible study, are you relieved when you get there? Do you feel like, oh, I finally made it. I can, I can let my guard down. I can, I can 
come get encouragement. I can be, I, I'm, I'm relieved to be here. Or does your guard go up? And immediately you're trying to put on this show, put on this face, or pretend to be something that deep down you know that you're not. Are you relieved or is your guard up? And if you're one of those individuals where your guard is up, I want to give you guys a pass on this because, listen, yeah, some of us, our personalities, you know, are more guarded than others, Right? All the introverts said nothing because they don't want to draw attention to themselves. But all the introverts would agree. They want to stay kind of pulled back. So there's some of us personality-wise that are just guarded. But if you feel that way, if you come to church and you, you feel immediately guarded and I have to stay back and make sure no one knows, that says more about us as a church than it does about you as an individual. It says more about the work that we need to do as a family than it does about maybe your own personalities and things like that. And so again, how do we begin to do this? To welcome one another as, as Christ has welcomed us. Well, I mean, for some people, it may simply begin by, by knowing each other. Like truly getting to know one another, moving beyond that, that smile and the handshake and maybe a name. Again, if you can go to the movies on Saturday and church on Sunday and the mechanics are about the same, then that's not a part of the church. That's a spectator. Maybe it begins by knowing one another, truly. For others, it, it, it begins with that daily reminder that every single one of us in this room, our default, our baseline, our, our starting point is that we are all sinful and broken people with darkened hearts and depraved minds. And if we are in Christ, we have been undeservedly saved by a loving and holy. And we are, by God's grace and through His Spirit, being transformed slowly over the course of our lives into the character of Jesus. And so it goes back to extending the same grace and forgiveness to others that Jesus continues to show us. And so that might mean that there's relationships that need to be repaired. In fact, I'll go ahead and say there are relationships in this room that need to be repaired. And I can go to any church right now in the country and sit here and say that. But I can also say it specifically about First Baptist Lexington. There are relationships that need to be repaired. There needs to be that extension of grace and mercy and forgiveness and welcome that Jesus has shown us, which is going to be hard. And that's why God needs to give us his endurance and his encouragement, that long journey of genuine community. Because here's the thing, at the end of the day, if by God's grace and for his glory, we begin to do this more and more, if by God's grace and for his glory, we begin to live in that harmony of life and unity of mind, in the pattern of Jesus, extending to him, or extending to each other, the same compassion and mercy and, and love and kindness that Jesus has shown us, here's that incredible third part that comes back. When we begin to actually lean into this together, the church itself becomes the channel of God's encouragement and endurance in our life. Like it's by the Holy Spirit, it's through Scripture, but the church becomes the place where we receive God's endurance and God's encouragement as we work out our salvation together in fear and trembling. So that we do gather together and when we do, we experience by the Holy Spirit, the endurance and the encouragement of God in our life. To, to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Jesus again today. And guys, I need that kind of community. I need that kind of church. The world needs that kind of example. And all of it points to the glory of God. And so may the God of endurance and encouragement grant us to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together with one voice we may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, 
Let's welcome one another as Christ Jesus has welcomed us to the glory of God. Let's pray. Gracious God, that is indeed my prayer for this family of believers at First Baptist. It's, not, it's my prayer not first and foremost as a pastor, God, but it's my prayer simply as a brother in Christ who wants to see your glory put on display in the world. I'm beginning right here in this local body of believers going out to Lexington, to the state, to the world. But Father, I know my own sinfulness and my own selfishness enough to understand why Paul asks for your endurance and your encouragement, God, towards that task. Father, the call to, to live lives without selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility to consider others as more important than ourselves, that is supernatural love that does not come within us naturally, Father. We need your Holy Spirit to do that work in us. And Father, as we do, there's going to be hard moments of forgiveness and service and self-sacrifice. Or to put on the humility and kindness and patience of love of Jesus is going to take more than what we have. It's going to take everything we have in your Holy Spirit empowering us. <laughs> And so, Father, would you please begin to do that good work in me and in all of us so that this might become something of a precept, something of a prescription for us as a body of believers here at First Baptist. Not that we will ever attain this completely or fully on our own, but that this would be what we strive for by your Spirit and for your glory. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.